Judges 7. We've been going through the last couple of weeks about uh, on a series of making my best better. And the only way to do that is to give it to the Lord Jesus Christ and let him have our lives. Then in no way can we make our uh, best better on our own, can we? It's just a futile attempt to do things on our own, trying to do or better ourselves. And that we've seen throughout history and in society today, people are trying to do that very thing. And ultimately, they do not do a very good job. We give it to the Lord and we say, God, here's my life. We saw in the life and we were going through the life of Gideon. And Gideon, as the Lord came to him, said, uh, Hail thou, uh, not hail, uh, the, the mighty man of valor. He says a similar thing, if you recall to Mary, where he says, uh, Hail, you know, uh, thou blessed woman. And he goes on and on and talking about. And both of these characters say, boy, me? You, you're talking to me. And uh, we see here how we looked at how God, what he sees and how he sees us in his will and not how we see ourselves. We looked at a little bit last week how some of the prerequisite to that of seeing that I need to admit my position, number one, and then I need to acknowledge the person of Christ and acknowledging that in my life. And then immediately what came next was an at an attempt to uh, remove, I should say, the paganism that was in Gideon's life and in his, in his own home with his father. The father stood up and stood up for the son and said, listen, I realize I'm wrong and we should not be trying to defend Baal and a really satanic worship, but defending the Lord Jesus Christ. We plead, he says, will you plead for Baal? Now, continuing on here in our series, we're going to see chapter 7. And uh, notice verse 1, it says, Then Jerubbabel, uh, who is Gideon and all the people that were with him, rose up early and pitched beside the well of Harad, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill Mor Mora in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, Now notice this, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. Now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there return to the people twenty and two thousand, and there remain ten thousand. Now, can you imagine the situation? Gideon's already a little bit nervous about what's going on. And God said, I want you to go. You're going to save Israel. <laughs> he says, okay, twenty two thousand turn away. Anybody afraid? Anybody scared? You can go home. 22, they said, I'm out of here, man. I'm not going. I'm not going to die. Left 10,000 people. Gideon's going, are you serious? Are you serious? Isn't that like our God? I love it. And this is why I'm so excited about our situation. This is exactly the environment God does his best work in, isn't it? And uh, people say, well, why would you start a little church in an office building when there's three churches directly around us? that are huge, literally hundreds of people attend these churches. Why would you do that? There's already, listen, number one, doctrine. We believe the right doctrine in this regard. And we're adhering to the scriptures as best we know how. And I know these churches do as well, but primarily doctrine. But we believe and see God does his best work in a situation like this. When the odds are stacked against us, where are they? As we've been looking at Sunday nights, will you go away? Will you go away? Stand and stay. Why? God does his work here, doesn't he? His best work in a place like this. And so he says, tell the people if they want to return, they can return. And they're left 10,000 people. And then verse 4, notice, And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people are yet too many. Can you imagine Gideon going, you're kidding me. <laughs> you're kidding me. Bring them down into the water and I will try them there. Uh, then them for thee there, and it shall be that of whom I say to thee, this shall go with thee. The same shall go with thee, and of whomsoever I say to thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. Now God is in control, obviously, and he'll bring the people that he wants, and he'll move the people that he doesn't want. Um, by the way, you don't want to bear more of our sake here. We don't want to serve a lot of people that are going to tuck tail and run when the first time of trouble. That are going to run away and go, whoa, finance says, boy, I don't know if we can have more building project. I don't think we can, boy, I don't know what we're going to do. You know, I don't know. I'm out of here. No, we don't want those people around. And God says, I want the strong, I want the faithful, I want the grounded ones. Now, first, first point here, let me say, is that 
In making my best better, he then removes the crutch. Moves the crutch. Remember, I don't get crutches for a while, right? Well, those were a pain, weren't they? Man, any of you had crutches before, you know how much of a pain they are. But God removes the crutch from our lives. All of us have a crutch, don't we? Some kind. We fall back maybe on your good looks, or you fall back, <laughs> you fall back on your, your education, or you have some kind of talent, you fall back on a job. I don't know what it is, but there's a crutch in our lives. And Gideon said, well, as long as I got these, right, 32,000 people, men, willing to fight, yes, we could at least stand a chance. Maybe we could make an impact. Maybe we could take out a few thousand, maybe 10,000 of these Midianites. Maybe we could do something. And God says, whoa, I'm going to remove that. Why? The man would know we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That you would know that I am, but you would know that I am all powerful. I am still on the throne. I am still in control, and I will take care of you. If God's all you have, I said a few weeks ago, you have all you need. If Jesus is all you have, you have all you need. You have all you need. And that's what he said. Remove the crutch. What's a couple crutches here? First crutch is the crutch of self-reliance. Self-reliance. He says the people, verse 2, are too many, lest they vaunt themselves against me. Now, knowing the nation of Israel, as God obviously knew them, and as Moses warned, and as Joshua uh, warned, and others warned, they were a stiff-necked people that constantly would return and go back to their evil ways and would go back to their self-centered ways. And he said, they'll fault themselves if I let all of you go out and fight. Yes, we did it. It's ours. We've done it. It's because of our hard work. It's because of our effort. Because of what we're doing. No. The crutch of self-reliance. Listen to Second, second Chronicles 16, 8. He says, Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubans a huge host with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet, because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thy hand. They were a great people. Chariots, horsemen. You didn't have any of that, he says. But because you relied upon God, the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, he delivered them into thy hands. Today, we rely upon God. We don't rely upon anything else. We need to rely upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And how do we show that? Our prayer life. How do we show that? The scriptures, the time we spend in the scriptures. Lord, I've got to know what you want me to do. How many times throughout the Psalms, Psalms and Proverbs, we got to, we're commanded or we're encouraged to rely on the Lord. Um, we think about this. We trust in uh, uh, the Lord. We trust. Get away from self-reliance. Get away from self. And when we have those thoughts or feelings of self-reliance, Lord, forgive me. Help us. Help me to do what I'm supposed to do. Second crutch would be self-preservation. Notice verse 3 again. Self-preservation. Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let them return. They're going, oh, listen, I value my life. I'd rather go home with my wife and family. I'd rather go back to the farm. I don't know whatever they were doing, wherever they were at, but I do not want to die. I don't want to give my life for the Lord or for this nation. And in order, as we said last week, to make my best better, ultimately and first and foremost is to come before the Lord and say, God, take my life and let it be. I am submitted to you. You do with what my life, what you want. And often, so, so often people say, well, then God removes all my good qualities and talents and he wants me to be this poor old missionary somewhere. No, he enhances everything that you have. He enhances your talents. He enhances your abilities. The love that you have, the, the hobbies that you enjoy, God doesn't take that away. He enhances that. He uses that in his ministry for his glory. How many men and women do we know? They have a talent in some area. Maybe it's uh, carpentry. Maybe it's in singing. Maybe it's in all these things. God enhances and uses that for his glory. By the way, shame on us if we're not using the talents God's given us for his glory, for his honor. You have some hidden talents. Some of you sing so well and you're hiding. <laughs> no, I don't know. Uh, you think about it. We need to give that to you. Self-preservation, though, it's a crutch. Lord, oh, but I, I want to be protected. I don't want to uh, be ruined. I don't want to be hurt. Lord, I, I would live by faith. I would step out by faith, but what if people criticize me? I would step out and serve and do what you want me to do, but what if this bad thing happens to him? Hey, leave it in God's hands. Because you relied upon him, the Lord, as he said in 2 Chronicles 16. He delivered them. He delivered them. 
So thinking through preservation. Luke 17, 33, whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. Whosoever shall lose his life shall notice this, preserve it. <laughs> complete opposite of the world. The Lord does things complete opposite of the world. If you lose your life for his sake, you will preserve it. How many people have give, given their lives, if you will, to the world, right? To the world. And ultimately you see they're depressed, they're lonely. The, just heard a couple of weeks ago, a multi-billionaire had everything when he took his own life. You're going, how could that happen? Why? He gave his life to the world. You lose your life. Some of the happiest people I've ever met in my life are people that have nothing, but they live for the Lord, right? Giving it all to Him. Trusting in Him. 2 Timothy 4.18 How the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto His heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. God preserve you. God will take care of you. Uh, there are over 29 verses about preserving His people. Preserving the Psalms especially, you ought to look it up on your app. You ought to look it up in your concordance at home. 29 verses about preserving his people. Don't rely upon the crutch of self-preservation. If you're in it to win it, give it to God. The next crutch of self-control. Self-control. Now thinking about this, notice verse 5. So he brought down the people into the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue, as a dog lappeth, him shall not set by himself. Likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink. And the number of them that laughed, putting their hand to their mouth, were three hundred men. But the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the three hundred men that laughed, will I save you, deliver the Midianites into, into my hand, and then all the other people go, every man, unto his place. Notice that. There's a crutch of self control, a lack thereof, even, in our world today. He said, As those guys that go down, they're so thirsty, and they just fall flat on their knees and on the face, and they're just drinking much. You know. But the guys that bow down on the knee and they keep their eyes out, out, up and looking around, and they draw water like this and bring it to their mouth. They're looking around. What are they doing? They're smart. They're keeping control. They're watching and going, listen, I'm not putting my head down. I'll take an arrow right to the top of the head. Right? <laughs> I'm not going to let my guard down. I want to be vigilant. Does it remind you of what Paul says in the New Testament? Be what? Sober and what? Vigilant, be sober. Walk with a sobriety about you. He then says, later he says in Ephesians, walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Meaning have a view of your life. Looking around. Too many Christians today, myself especially, we walk around we like heads down. Not that we're depressed or anything, we're just down. We're not watching what the adversary is doing. He's shooting an arrow from here. He's shooting a fiery dart this way. No, I'm not looking, but I've been down being faithful, sober, vigilant, and what am I doing? Watching out, looking. Hey, 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 what are my kids doing over there? Hey, hey, hey what's going on over here? My finances. Oops. <laughs> what am I doing? Oh, oh, I should have been a witness there, and I wasn't. I wasn't a good testimony. You're, you're, you're looking around. You're staying sober, vigilant, attentive to what's going on around you. The men that ran down to the water said, oh, good night, I'm so thirsty. They plopped down on their face and just started drinking the water. No self-control. No self-control. Now, the Bible uses different terminology for self-control. 1 Timothy 5.22, Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins. And then it says, Keep thyself pure. Keep thyself pure. Talking to Timothy. Purity. No one else can be pure for you. Nobody. Nobody else. So many people want to blame other people for their impurity. Blame your parents. Oh, uh, because of what uh, I'm, I was impure. No. Nobody else can be pure for you. Now notice that. There's a self-control. Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray. Ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He's saying be cautious and careful. Yes, the spirit is willing. The flesh is weak. Yes, you want to do right. Yes, you want to do what God's asked you to do. But be careful. The flesh is weak. So watch and pray. Keep yourself pure. Right? Self-control. First Thessalonians 5, 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others. But let us watch and be sober. Be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, walking about as what? A roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Devour. He wants to kill. He wants to destroy your life. Now, notice that he removes the crutch. Let me say secondly here, and I don't know how far I'll get, but uh, we'll see uh, how far we can go here. The revelation of the conquest. The revelation of the conquest. 
Now, verse 9, notice this. And it came to pass the same night, the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered it into thy hand. Wait, what? He's already delivered the, the host into his hand? The victory's already there? Isn't that a great God? He already says, hey, I've already given it to into your hands. The revelation of the conflict. Uh, but if thou fear, he says, verse 10, go down with Pura, thy servant. And thou shalt hear, verse 11, what they say. Afterward shall thine hands be strengthened to go down into the host. They went down, they go on and on. Uh, notice verse 13, and when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow. They're listening in the dark. They're hiding. And said, Behold, I dreamed a dream. Lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian and came into a tent and smote it that it fell and overturned it that the tent lay along. And his fellow answered and said, This is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, a man of Israel. For into his hand hath God delivered Midian and all the host. The entire host of Midian already knew <laughs> who Gideon was. You say, well, I'm a nobody. Nobody knows about no, You don't know that. God has put you on somebody else's heart. You don't know the impact you're having in other churches and in other people. And your brothers and your sisters, and they're going, yeah, they're still faithful over there. I don't know who to call. Our, our marriage is falling apart. Oh, I know. Call brother so-and-so. He's faithful to God. Call dad, mom. They know what to do. They're faithful to God. You don't know who God has put uh, you on whose heart. You don't know that. You don't know the impact you're having in other people's life. You can be a child and people know that. You know, boy, they're a good kid. The revelation of the conquest. They say, we know what it is. It's Gideon. He's going to come and destroy us. You remember that the same thing was told in a city called Jericho? And they came across the river and uh, old uh, uh, Rahab came. They said, hey, she said, I know who you are. I know who you are. You're the you're the children of God. You're, you're Israel. And God's already delivered us into your hands. And she goes on and on. And they just, they're shocked and surprised. They're going, really? You already know that? Yeah, you already know that. So it's a revelation of conquest. You and I have already conquered this world. Don't forget that. So, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 54. So when this corruptible, corruptible, excuse me, shall put on incorruption, this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? But thanks be to God, which giveth us the what? Victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Victory. Present tense. We already have the victory. A revelation of conquest. Too many Christians we know walk around. We're down, we're depressed, we're cranky, we're critical. That's me. <laughs> we're in the right spirit sometimes, like we should. Where do you think? Why are you downtrodden, O soul? Why are you cast down, O soul? Why? You don't understand and realize what the Bible says about the victory. We already have the conquest. We already have the, the, the victory is already in our pocket. We already know 1 John 5, 4. For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Our faith overcomes the world. Oh, what a victory. What a victory. I must hurry here. Notice here, though, it comes by hearing the word of God. How do we have the conquest? How do we have the victory? Well, it comes by hearing the word of God. Notice what it says. He heard, verse 9, The Lord said unto him, Arise and get thee down. I have delivered it into thy hand. I've already done it. I've already done it. We must hear the word of God. Christians who do not spend time in their Bibles do not understand the victory. Christians who don't spend time in their Bibles do not know the victory, the conquest that they already have. They've already conquered the world. They've already conquered the flesh. They've already conquered. How do they know that? The Bible says so. The Bible says so. Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Matthew 13, 15, for this people's heart is wax gross and their ears are dull of hearing. Their eyes have they closed. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. Jesus said, I want to heal you. I want to take care of you. I want to give you eternal life. But your ears are shut. Your eyes are closed. You're not listening. You're not listening. Uh, my fellow, he came in, he was down on his luck one day and he was boy looking for work, looking for money. He knocked and he saw an attorney, attorney's office. He went and knocked on the door. Kind of a mean... Uh, kind of 
Costa kind of fella came out and said, yeah, what do you want? He said, I'm sorry to bother you, sir, but I'm just looking for some work. I'm looking for some way to make some money. Is there anything I can do around here to make some money? He said, well, not really, but in fact, I was going to paint my front porch here, the entryway, the porch. And if you want to do that, i got to paint some rollers of brush there. Why don't you get started on that? Just, I'll come out when you're done and inspect it. And I'll see if I'm going to pay you or not, if you're worth the money. No real room. And the guy said, okay, yes, sir, I'll do whatever you want me to do. He started on the job. And about 30 minutes later, he comes in. He's got paint all over. You know, you can obviously tell. He says, that was fast. He said, yeah. He said, I got it done, sir. He said, wow, thank you. Thank you. He said, well, let me come check it out. He said, well, before you do, I wanted to make mention of something. I think you misspoke. He said, that's not a Porsche out there. That's a Mercedes. <laughs> so a little, little dull on hearing there. Messed up on his uh, uh, thing. But uh, you think about it. Okay. Uh, it comes by hearing the word of God. Cal it calms our hearts to walk forward. He said you can keep going. Now, again, coming back to this. Understanding you got to spend time in the scriptures. The conquest is already yours. And when you realize you have the victory... It calms your heart to be able to walk forward. I would walk forward. Oh, I'm so nervous. I would walk forward, but I don't know what's gonna, what the day holds. I don't know what the future's going to hold. I don't know if we can ever, oh, hush up and read your Bible. <laughs> Calm down, read your Bible. Hear the word of God. Helps us to walk forward. Galatians 6, verse 16. As many as walk, and as many, excuse me, as walk according to this rule. Peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. The rule that Paul set forward. Peace will be on you. Uh, understanding that. Uh, Philippians 4, 7, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Through Christ Jesus. Worry, fear, insecurity, all of that comes from our hearts and our minds. He says, peace of God. How do we do it? Spending time with Him. Following this. Let me say here, and I'll wrap it up. It claims the hope to win. It claims the hope to win. Now, as we see here, Let's go to Romans chapter 5, and Romans 5, and for sake of time, I apologize, we'll have to wrap it up here. Romans 5, and we'll continue some of this uh, either this evening or next week. Uh, but uh, Romans 5, it claims the hope. It claims the hope. You dear folks know your Bibles, and you have read this many times, but Romans 5, listen, it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice, notice, in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which was given unto us. He says we have hope. Why? The love of God is shed abroad on our hearts because we understand what God did for me. He died on the cross. Christ went all the way for me. He bled and died. When I realize that depth of love that Christ has for me, well, it helps me. I can endure tribulations. I can endure these things, experience, and it brings hope. Hope. The hope to win. As we understand this, the victory is already mine. The claim, the victory, the conquest is already there. And he said to Gideon, it's already done. You already have the victory. You already have it. And we ought to say, listen, Lord, uh, listen, Lord, I want to claim the hope. The hope. We have hope. Hope maketh not ashamed. Verse 5. Make not ashamed. Not ashamed. Why? I already know what Christ did for me. I already know his love. And if he didn't love me enough to die on the cross, shed his blood, I know he's coming back for me. I know he has uh, his best interests in mind. I know he's not going to just flake out on me. I know that he loves me. He'll care for me. He'll keep me. He'll walk with me and talk with me along life's narrow way. On this solid rock I stand. All other ground. A-L-L. -L, all other ground is singing sand. I wish more people would understand that, don't you? People at your workplace or people around your family members, whatever. They would understand. All other ground is sinking sand. Nothing else compares to that. Okay. I have several more points here. Uh, I'll finish some of this maybe next week or Lord willing. I don't know which way he'll lead me in that, but maybe this evening or, or next week. But thinking about this, I want to encourage you with it. Don't forget, God wants to remove the crutch from our lives. Why? So we can see his work and his power. He wants to also reveal to us the conquest. We already have the victory, folks. No more need we walk with a sour look or a bad attitude or anything. Else. Oh, this world's so hard to live. Yeah, it is, but we already have the victory. 
the Midianites were hundreds of uh, thousands. I don't know how many, but many, many, many thousands. And uh, you re- will read some of the story next week, but they, Gideon didn't do anything. They didn't lift one sword, did they? They stood around, broke the lamps, yelled out, and they all started killing each other, the Midianites. <laughs> and so often, God, how am I going to accomplish this task? God says, you're not. I'm going to do it if you'll just obey and do what I've asked you to do. Oh, I'm so thankful for that. Okay, I'll stop there. But I pray that God has your heart today, and you are winning and living the winning side and living the victory for him. Realize God wants the very best for you, making my best better, my best better. God wants to do that for you. Let us pray today. Lord, thank you so much for this time in your word. Although brief, Lord, I pray that you'd help us, God, to apply what you've given to us. Uh, Lord, I'm so excited about what you're going to do, and I know these people are as well. Thank you for all that you're doing. I think about, Lord, that song this morning that one day we'll never grow old. One day we'll get to spend time with those loved ones that have passed on before. And Father, we'll we'll, we'll win life's crown and we will be able to spend eternity, not only with those loved ones, but with you, Lord. No more tears, no more pain, no more of this world, Lord. We pray you'd help us to remain faithful unto the end and for you. And Lord, help us, Lord, to realize you're removing those crutches in our lives for our good so that you can, Lord, reveal your power and then God reveal the conquest that we already have the victory. We're already living on the winning side. Strengthen us, God, through thy word. The only way we'll know that daily and believe that daily is to spend time with you in your word and in prayer. Lord, we love you. Thank you again for this facility, for this space that you've given us and all that you're doing. In thy precious name, we do pray today. Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thank you.